Good evening, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, welcome. I'm Sara Pantuliano, I'm the Chief Executive here at ODI, and I'm really delighted to introduce tonight's conversation and welcome to ODI President Masa Asakawa, the President of the Asian Development Bank. It's a real pleasure to have you with us, uh, Masa. Masa has been the President of the ADB since January 2020. So from the very start, we've had a really challenging period <laughs> to deal with, you know, a very difficult period for the global economy, obviously the pandemic, you know, the energy crisis. But that hasn't stopped you from trying to raise the ambition of the ADB to help, particularly with the climate crisis. Um, prior to joining the ADB, President Massa served as the special advisor to Japan's prime minister and the minister of finance after... 40 years of uh, a career in the Ministry of Finance. I think amongst the highlights of your career, you were the finance deputy for the G20 meeting under the Japanese presidency in 2019. But why is tonight's conversation important? This is the latest iteration in our MDB, um, MDB leader series. And, and the reason why we focused you know, so much on this, and we are really delighted to have had you know, so many leaders of the MDBs, is because they become central to the conversation about reforming the international financial architecture. And they matter because these are, of course, organizations that have played an important role in you know, helping deliver to climate commitments, um, helping address some of the regional challenges, you know, some global challenges, uh, mobilize you know, financing, better you know than some bilateral donors but they're no longer really fit for purpose they, they obviously were created at a time um, that you know had different challenges and has changed um quite a lot and so they need to be fit for the 21st century that's why they need to evolve and they need, they need to be able to work better together as a, as a system and in reality a lot of the conversation to date has focused a lot on uh, um the world bank um, we were just, you know, discussing before, you know, we started um, in, in the private room that this is really um, almost like monopolized the conversation because of the reform process known as the evolution roadmap. And this is, I think, in a way, um, not allowed the innovations that other MDBs have made to come to the fore and be discussed, you know, to be recognized and celebrated, because actually there has been quite a lot of creativity and innovation in other MDBs. And, you know, what the ADB has done is one of them. And I'm hoping that we'll hear a bit, you know, sort of from you tonight um, about some of them, you know, particularly the, um, the merger of the lending operations of the Asia Development Fund that brought together, you know, the concessional window of the ADB with the ordinary capital resources, the non-concessional window, which allowed the ADB um, lending and grants to increase by 50% without, you know, an, an extra injection of money from shareholders. So I'm, I'm hoping we'll hear all of that today because, you know, we want to really show what different MDBs are doing and what, you know, inspirations other can, can take from uh, the work of, of their colleagues. So I hope that tonight we'll focus on three things in particular. The first, hearing a little bit about the, the prospects and the challenges of the Asia-Pacific region. Um, second, you know, the role of the, the um, ADB plays to support its client countries, you know, particularly around the low carbon transitions. And then, you know, how the ADB has innovated its approach to, you know, sort of optimize its balance sheet and you know, meet its uh, capital adequacy requirements. And to help reflect on you know, this progress, innovations, and what else others can do, I also have a great panel you know, to join the President um, Massa. To my left, I have Kate Hampton. Kate is the CEO of the Children Investment Fund Foundation, CIF. She has a long-standing career that spans roles in government, in finance, consulting, think tank, and NGOs. She importantly was in Bridgetown for the very first, you know, initial workshop that launched the initiative last year that we've all been, you know, discussing and engaging with, and has since played a key pivotal, you know, advisory role um, to, Pres to Prime Minister Motley and, of course, ahead of the Paris Summit. I'm sure we'll talk about the Paris Summit in the course of the conversation. Next to Kate is Chris Humphrey. Chris is uh, a senior research associate here at ODI and is a senior scientist at ETH, ETH Zurich Center for Development Cooperation. But since 2021, he's actually been a member of the G20 Independent Review into the MDB's Capital Advocacy Framework. I'm sure you'll tell us all about it, Chris. And last but not least, um, next to President Maza is Annalisa Prizzon. Annalisa is a principal research fellow at ODI and our 
own, you know, very valiant leader on everything MDBs, you know, sort of she leads on the work around the policies and the finances of the MDBs. So after, you know, a few uh, a discussion with the panel, I'll open it up for questions, both to our online audience and, of course, all of you in the room. Um, but ahead of the posing questions to the panel, please do engage on Twitter. The hashtag is ReformMDBs. Just, you know, amplify your conversation right on LinkedIn as well. You know, we don't want to be discriminatory, but usually there is a bit more of a buzz, you know, on, on Twitter. Um, so the others can also sort of... Share, you know, hear your reflections. But without further ado, let me turn to President Massa. Um, Massa, the ADB uh, serves countries across the Asia Pacific. And, you know, these are also countries that have been hit by multiple crises. Um, can you tell us a little bit what you see as the key challenges for the region and, and why the region matters for Europe? Well, thank you, Rosa. Uh, first of all, I am very glad to be here in London today. And uh, thank you very much, ODI, to arrange this uh, panel and give me an opportunity to speak to you. And also, I'm very, uh, very much looking forward to, uh, uh, to, to having a meeting with uh, FCOD, uh, FCDO, uh, Minister uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, tomorrow. Uh, first of all, let me briefly talk uh, about uh, uh, the economic outlook in Asia and what's the challenges running ahead. Uh, so-called uh, developing Asia, which means, you know, uh, developing countries in Asia, Pacific region, excluding developed countries. So it, it excludes Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Okay. Uh, developing Asia's economic growth rate in 2022 uh, was 4.2%, uh, down from 7.2%. So it was very big down, but compared with other parts of the region, I think 4.2% was a good number. And this year, in 2023, we project uh, this number uh, to be around 4.8%. Uh, while the inflation rate has been uh, generally uh, well contained, uh, we project this year the inflation, the, uh, the headline inflation rate uh, for developing Asia is around, will be around 4.2%. Uh, and next year, it will go down to 3.3%. So I would say, in one word, I would say, uh, developing Asia uh, has been growing in a very steady and robust way. Although we have to bear in mind a couple of uh, downside risks. Let me uh, mention a few. Uh, first of all, the first downside risk we have to bear in mind is obviously the economic prospect of advanced economies, US and Europe. Uh, as you know, as the central banks of U US and Europe has, have uh, risen uh, its policy rate a couple of times to quell the inflation uh, pressure, and quite recently, they have slowed down uh, the uh, pace of interest rate hike. And quite recently, the uh, U.S. stopped, you know, uh, temporary or not, we don't know. Uh, but, but yet, we don't know if uh, those advanced economies will end up with so-called uh, soft landing scenario or falling into recession uh, due to the persistent uh, uh, inflation uh, in the service sector, labor market, and so on. We don't know. That's the first risk. A second risk related to the first risk uh, is that you know uh, this very rapid you know space of uh, monetary uh, policy normalization has really tightened uh, global financial conditions. Really tightened. Both ends, short end, long end of yield curve ha have risen, and uh, risk premium has expanded. And uh, quite recently, we saw signs of strains in the banking sector, both in the US and Europe. So as a result, we, I am seeing, we are seeing a continuous pressure uh, to our region uh, for possible abrupt capital outflow, capital outflow out of our region, and also pressure for a sharp, possible sharp depreciation of our regional currencies. We should be really be careful about that. Although this pressure has mitigated somewhat quite recently because of the moderating pace of monetary policy normalization in the US. Uh, to respond, uh, as the central banks in our region has also risen uh, its policy rate a couple of times, uh, but that uh, would uh, constrain a great growth, but growth uh, perspective uh, of each country, obviously. A third risk is, uh, you know, that steep uh, uh, price increase in energy and food 
exacerbated uh, by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, really aggravated uh, balance of payment uh, problem of some of the vulnerable countries in that region, like Pakistan, like Sri Lanka, and so on. So we are closely watching uh, the uh, situation in those countries and also uh, maintain close uh, communication with the World Bank IMF about the most updated uh, financial and economic situation of those countries. But more in general, you know, more in general, we are very much concerned about food security issue, food security issue. Uh, in uh, 2021, one year before, even one year before this Russian invasion of Ukraine, 425 million people in the region were affected by hunger, malnutrition, 425 million. So we have to urgently address this, uh, you know, hunger, hunger problem while developing a long-term solution to address, uh, you know, uh, food security issue. Uh, so to respond, uh, uh, last year in September, when we had the annual meeting in Manila, uh, we ADB announced the 14 billion US dollar uh, financial package to address this uh, issue, uh, which consists of uh, both uh, short-term measure and long-term measure. Short-term measure is, you know, to uh, these are budget financing, uh, very quick dispersing budget financing uh, to support uh, our uh, developed, developing member countries. Uh, to provide food and other necessities, uh, especially for poor and vulnerable. And long-term measure includes uh, investment in agriculture sector to make our agricultural system in a, in, in a region more robust and resilient uh, by utilizing climate smart agriculture technique, uh, nature-based solution, and also further utilization of digitalization, digitalization uh, for uh, food supply chains and so on. Finally, the fourth uh, risk we have to bear in mind is China. As you may know, it the Chinese economy fell, growth rate you know, sharply uh, uh, went down from 8.4% in 2021 to 3%, only 3% in 2022, due to the couple of reasons. One, very, very stringent zero corona policy, and two, a uh, couple of you know, structural problems they are facing in their real estate sector and so on. But as you know, at the end of last year, they finally exited uh, from uh, zero corona policy. So this year, in 2023, we expect a uh, Chinese economy to recover. Uh, we uh, ADB uh, project 5% uh, growth. Uh, that is a good thing uh, for a commodity, commodity exporting country to China, and also for countries, for the countries uh, who have a, a close linkage in, uh, with China in terms of uh, uh, supply chain network and also uh, tourism. Uh, but when I looked at uh, the very uh, uh, first uh, quarter's uh, growth rate of China, which was 4.5%, which was not really encouraging. So I would say how China will perform from now on is another, you know, a dance of risk we have to bear in mind. Great. Well, you mentioned hunger as, you know, a key sort of challenge for the region. But obviously the other one is uh, natural hazard related disasters, you know, that are linked to the climate. Um, and, you know, when it comes to climate, ADB is actually introduced a pretty important commitment, you know, to raise uh, climate financing for its developing members by 100 billion before 2030. And not just that, you know, I think the other thing that ADB has done is to commit to ensuring that three quarters of all the projects approved um, have to support climate change mitigation or adaptation by 2030. I and mean, these are ambitious and and challenging commitments. Um, so can you tell us a little bit how the ADB plans to deliver on these commitments? Yeah. You know, what kind of reforms have you had to put in place? Okay, a couple of things I'd like to mention. Uh, first of all, let me say it's a very uncomfortable truth uh, that the Asian Pacific region is accountable for more than 50% of CO2 gas em emissions. That's the truth. And another uncomfortable truth is that at the same time, our region, Asia Pacific region, is one of the most vulnerable regions uh, vis a vis you know, natural disasters related to climate change. So I always say our fight against uh, climate change in our region uh, would be won or lost. Won or lost. And uh, also, I say that development will not be possible without effective climate action. 
uh, two years ago, there was a COP26 in Glasgow, and I went there. But before I went there, in, inside the ADB, we discussed quite intensively what kind of contribution we should make, we could make uh, for COP uh, process. And we made a couple of very important decisions you know, uh, on climate action. One is, as Sarah, you mentioned, we elevated our ambition uh, to $100 billion of cumulative uh, climate financing uh, for 12 years, uh, from 2019 to 2030. So if you divide 100 billion by 12 years, you will come up with 8.3 billion per year. That's a you know, very simple average uh, as a target uh, for climate financing by us. Uh, actually, our achievement uh, in 2021, in the midst of COVID-19, was 3.5 billion, so far below our target. But in 2022, last year, it went up to 6.7 billion. And this year, I'm quite sure uh, we could be close to 8 billion. So this year and beyond, uh, we will make our best uh, to, achieve one, uh, to achieve 100 billion you know, ambition as, uh, as soon as possible. And also, uh, let me add that we also uh, aim at uh, investing at least one third of 100 billion, which means 34 billion US dollars be invested in adaptation, not only mitigation, but in adaptation. That's one thing. The second thing I'd like to mention is in order to increase our, our climate financing investment, climate investment, uh, we are working on one innovative, very innovative financial instrument called IFCAP, IF-CAP. I don't know if you have ever heard of this or not, but IFCAP stands for uh, Innovative Finance, uh, Innovative Finance, Finance for uh, climate in Asia and Pacific, IF CAP, uh, which is an instrument uh, to increase ADB's uh, climate investment by uh, utilizing guarantee uh, by the bilateral donors. And the beauty of this uh, you know, system is this instrument is that you know, whenever one dollar of ADB's operation lending is guaranteed by any donors like UK, right? then we can ex expand not only one dollar, but under our simulation, five dollars, five dollars of investment investment. So leverage ratio is one to five. And uh, I'm very proud to report to you uh, that uh, this e at this year's annual meeting in, in Chong, uh, we had the, uh, last month, uh, we launched this IFCAP. And already a couple of donors uh, showed strong interest in, in making contribution to IFCAP. Uh, by providing guarantee, you know, uh, by then, UK, US, Japan, Denmark, Sweden, and South Korea so far, and uh, we we are talking to a couple of others. Uh, so I hope that this gap, uh, when completed, uh, would greatly contribute uh, to achieve our you know 100 billion ambition, uh, uh, which I, I mentioned earlier. And thirdly and finally, uh, let me tell you uh, that. Uh, uh, once again, uh, before the uh, COP, uh, COP26, uh, we devised our so-called energy policy of ADB, and we officially decided and, uh, to withdraw our financing uh, for uh, new coal-fired power plants. So we won't do it anymore, right? Yeah, but uh, still the issue remains that in our region, there are so many you know, coal-fired coal -fired power plants already existing and operating. So, and they are relatively young. Young means less than 20 years old. So if we don't do anything, they will just stay on for another 10 years, 20 years, and even 30 years from now. So we have to let them retire early, earlier than originally scheduled. So to that end, we are also working on another innovative financing mechanism called ETM. I'm sorry about so many abbreviations. <laughs> But the ETM stands for uh, Energy Transition Mechanism, uh, which is an instrument uh, which combines uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, commercial you know, financing uh, provided by uh, private sector financial institutions with uh, grant, grant money or highly concessional financing provided by bilateral donors. Bilateral donors, and we mix them up to make so-called blended financing, uh, to make uh, you know, low-cost financing. And thanks to this low-cost financing uh, scheme, uh, ETM-financed uh, coal-fired power plants 
uh, the expected return uh, could be achieved in a shorter time period price than originally scheduled. That's, that's how ETM could let existing coal-fired power plants retire early, earlier than you know, uh, originally scheduled. And I'm proud to say that, you know, as a margin of a G20 summit meeting uh, last year in Bali in November, uh, we could sign one MOU to specify one concrete uh, coal-fired power plant in Indonesia called Chilebo 1 in West Java, 660 uh, megawatts to be retired earlier early uh, under this uh, ETM. Uh, that was the first step. And I'm, uh, I really, really hope that the you know, application of ETM would be expanded to other parts of the Indonesia and also other parts of our region. Thank you. I can feel your passion. For, you know, the commitment is great, actually, you know, to hear how you're, you know, really trying to accelerate um, the delivery on, on, you know, the commitments you've made to try and, and support the uh, the energy transition in the Asia Pacific. Kate, you've been very active in this space, you know, from the Bridge Done Initiative onward. Um, and Bridge Done is really focused on trying and then transform, you know, the international financial architecture. What do you think the NBBs need to do? What are the priority actions to be deliver in this kind of commitment? Uh, thank you very much. And um, I really want to commend the work that ODI has been doing um, in this space, which has been really helpful to the overall effort. And I'll, I'll speak to some of the, the areas where ADB is leading and could do more as well. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that the Bridgetown Initiative and Bridgetown 2.0 and the Accra Marrakesh agenda of the vulnerable 20, um, now more than that, countries um, have set out some very specific reforms that they expect to see from the international financial system. Um, the Stern Songwei Bhattacharya report said we need one trillion in external finance outside of China in emerging um, and developing economies. Um, there is no way that we are going to do that without a massive expansion in capacity of the uh, MDBs, um, as well as, you know, combined with reform and capital increases. Um, we know that. Um, We've squandered a decade of low interest rates when it comes to climate transition. Um, and we're really taking this seriously at the point where the cost of capital has shot up due to mon monetary policy um, in the West, which is unfortunate. But it really does mean now we need a laser focus on reducing the cost of capital uh, for many countries. And we need the political will to make the MDBs um, act as a system. I think obviously, you know, if you take the World Bank, there are some things which have been tabled which are pretty clear. And I think these will be echoed by the G20 expert group as well that's going to publish around the same time as Paris. Scaling of IDA, tripling of non-concessional lending, you know, improving the equity uh, to loan ratio further. We're going to need a capital increase. Um, we're also seeing a number of countries talk about new financial vehicles, um, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, but obviously, this is not just about the World Bank. Um, it's about the whole system. Um, and I think ADB in particular has been playing a leading role in some areas. So I think um, really leading on the Indonesian JetP is an example of a multilateral development bank really responding um, to the need for, for ambition and coordination. I think also IFCAP, which you mentioned, um, my colleagues in uh, Southeast Asia were very keen that I, I mentioned that actually. So thank you for sharing that as a really interesting uh, uh, mechanism. And in fact, there are many people looking at how we improve hybrid capital and guarantees as a way of leveraging more private sector capital. I think that's absolutely crucial. The record of MDBs at the moment is very poor one-to-one -one leverage, which we can do a lot better for. Um, I think, you know, the Asian Development Bank is also led by having a good roadmap. It would be good to see other MDBs um, do more there. Um, but I also think there's quite a series of things which aren't being tackled yet. Uh, the Barbados government has just come forward with a, pro um, a, a proposal with TCX on dealing with currency risk, which is a really serious impediment uh, for many countries to access financing. Um, there are also, you know, some basics around standardizing term sheets for mature assets to make uh, money flow much more easily um, and really helping countries develop uh, KPIs for, you know, debt reform and a move towards a more KPI led structure that's really country owned. 
Um, there's lots of proposals out there. ODI has made some, uh, CPI has done a paper in collaboration with others on a new operating model for the MDBs. Um, and I think, um, you know, Paris is going to be a really, really important moment. So it isn't a formal decision making body. Um, and the French um, deserve credit for picking up um, the call from Prime Minister Motley and others and creating a, a space to have these conversations. Um, that being said, it is a political forum with heads of state and heads of institutions. Um, so we really are going to need an agenda that is set with developing countries and a number of developing country heads of state are actually going to be there. Uh, that responds to the recommendations that have been made very explicitly by these countries and sets a roadmap coming out of it that's ambitious, inclusive, time-bound, and that heads of state and heads of institutions are volunteering to lead on certain pieces and take them forward. And so I would encourage uh, the ADB to lead in the areas where it's uh, already showing leadership and identify where's where it could go further. Um, Leaders are going to have to take ownership and measure progress, um, but we're going to need to remember that, you know, there's a range of needs. Um, what works in terms of private sector leverage for upper middle income countries, which are decarbonizing, but are already industrialized, is very different from what countries need if they're in a process of industrialization and really want to participate in the green transition and not be set, shut out and stuck in another commodity trap and really get on the pathway of value addition. So we need to make sure that the conversations we're having in Paris and beyond, uh, in Marrakesh, at the Africa Climate Summit, at COP28, are thinking about the different needs of countries. And I think we will see reforms in MDBs. I think we will see new vehicles emerge. What we need to avoid is further fragmentation of the system. We need to make transaction costs so much lower for countries. And so I worry about the new versus reform agenda not actually meeting the needs of, of countries where they are. I think the geopolitics are also challenging. And to get beyond that, you know, we need political incentives for people to start putting money on the table even before some of the governance issues are um, resolved. And that will require an inclusive process and a commitment to grandfathering in terms of the things that work, piloting at scale, and so on. Um, so I think we're going to need a bit of governance uh, creativity. But if we don't have a really clear, time-bound, ambitious and inclusive roadmap coming out of Paris, where institutions and countries are taking accountability for delivery, the level of mistrust and the crisis and the human impact is just going to is just going to accelerate. It's it's really really serious, um, and we saw at COP uh, um, at the preparations for COP twenty eight uh, in the last couple of weeks over Bonn, they broke down. They couldn't even agree an agenda for COP twenty eight because of finance questions. Um, now climate negotiators can't can't resolve those, but those that have access to finance and can provide a contribution to the climate conversation really need to step up now and solve that problem. Otherwise, we could see the disintegration of the multilateral climate process, which would be an absolute disaster, particularly for the most vulnerable, but for all of us. Thank you, Kate. Paris definitely, you know, provides that political momentum that we need to embrace and support, as you say, you know, the roadmap uh, needs to engage all of us from the MDBs to, you know, the think tanks, uh, the governments to make sure that we make progress. But you also said very clearly, we need more money to be put on the table. And that is not easy because, you know, the shareholders are resisting it. I know that that's something you're also, you know, sort of trying, you know, to to get, you know, so shareholders to come up with. Now, the other thing that we've been sort of pushing at ODI is to get the, getting more money on the table is using the money that the MDBs already have better. And of course, that's, you know, work that I'm sure Chris will say more about in terms of, uh, you know, using, you know, the, the, the review that the G20 conducting on, on the use of the um, of MDB's own capital, on the capital adequacy framework review, um, which, of course, you know, recommended some important sort of next steps on how to use this capital without risking the AAA rating. I'm sure Chris can say a lot more about it later. But I just wanted to hear how the ADB had heeded the recommendations of uh, um, the, the CAF report mm. and what you're doing you know, to try and make more with what you already have. Yeah, talking of uh, capital adequacy framework, we do have our own framework and we are supposed to update it every three years, every three years. And this year is the uh, review year. Uh, so we are you know, working on seriously on, on it. And at the same time, 
uh, we are carefully reviewing uh, the recommendation made by a G20 independent panel, as you mentioned. Uh, it may be a little bit too early uh, to draw a firm con conclusion at this stage, but I'm of a strong impression uh, that ADB shareholders uh, does not wish to uh, dramatically change our risk appetite uh, at this time, uh, which means uh, the new CAF uh, coming out of this year's review uh, will continuously protect the AAA rating, as uh, you mentioned, uh, to ensure uh, that uh, investors' confidence be maintained and to ensure that uh, ADP uh, would have a sufficient capital uh, to continuously end, even under serious, very serious uh, crisis situation, without without uh, relying on corable capital. Chris may be of a different view on this point, but uh, that's what our uh, shareholders uh, is telling me. Uh, that said, uh, we are taking this opportunity to update our uh, CAF, uh, Capital Adequacy Framework, uh, to comprehensively review uh, for uh, further option to uh, optimizing our balance sheet. Uh, for example, we might consider to lower uh, the prudential level of capitalization uh, based on a very strong capital, capital uh, base. And, and also I'd like to add that even before uh, this year's uh, CAF review, we have taken a couple of measures uh, to optimize our balance sheet. For example, uh, balance sheet exchange with other MDBs, it's called exposure exchange agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done uh, actually twice uh, with uh, inter-American development bank in, in order to reduce the country concentration risk. We have now in, on our uh, uh, balance sheet for example, Argentina, <laughs> and they have uh, Pakistan, for example, right? Uh, by doing that, we, we can reduce our country concentration risk. We, and we have done twice uh, with a total amount of $2.5 billion so far. And also another example is quite recently, uh, we introduced, uh, we established uh, $1 billion so-called model insurance uh, program uh, in terms of our non-sovereign uh, lending uh, with uh, five Global five global uh, leading insurers to risk transfer, and also as I mentioned to you, IFCAP uh, is. Uh, I, I, I'm really proud that you know, ADB has shown such a great appetite for uh, you know innovative financing mechanism like IFCAP, which is to increase our uh, climate financing uh, uh, by utilizing guarantees mechanisms. And all in all, I would say. Uh, maybe the combination of various uh, measures coming out of this year's uh, CAF review would uh, enable uh, would uh, free up additional ADB capital uh, so that uh, we can uh, continuously, uh, no, not continuously, but, uh, but uh, uh, increasingly, we can increase our lending capacity uh, without uh, uh, compromising uh, investors' confidence, without compromising to repair rate. Thanks. Well, you wonder whether Chris agrees. Do you agree, Chris? <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> Let's find out. Um, no, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and it's also nice to be able to say complimentary things about ADB, because to be honest, ADB has been quite forward leaning over a number of years before the capital advocacy framework uh, work that I was uh, involved in. The merger of the AFD concessional lending window back in 2016, 2017, that was a tremendous reform. That was essentially a 30 odd billion dollar capital increase effectively to the ADB, which allowed ADB to be able to do the kind of counter cyclical lending that you were talking about in the crisis. Um, so very effective. Obviously, the exposure exchanges that you mentioned, the risk transfers to the insurance industry, all very uh, forward leaning and innovative. I should also mention the first portfolio guarantee was done by ADB with the Swedish government back in 2016. Uh, and that was a model that other MDBs have since followed and have begun scaling up uh, across the MDB system. So that was that was a really excellent uh, innovation. Uh, in terms of the G20 independent review itself, uh, which began about two years ago now, ADB was, uh, you know, the team, uh, your, your bank's team, uh, was very actively and constructively engaged with the process um, in a way that some of the other NDBs were a little bit less so. So I definitely would like to offer credit to ADB's team on that. 
both in terms of being open to discussing these ideas, which some MDBs were quite resistant to even talk about some of this stuff, as well as sharing data uh, and being open to sharing data in a way that other MDBs weren't not uh, necessarily um, in the way we would have liked. So that's all very good. In terms of the actual reforms itself, I would agree with you that it is a little early to tell still uh, because these are complex reforms. What we're talking about is trying to kind of rethink I mean, the basic approach to capital addicts we is something that has dated back decades. And now, you know, it's gotten sort of stuck in a certain pattern. Um, there's a lack of standards. There's no regulator for MDBs. There's no Basel III. Nobody really knows what's adequate. How much capital do you need to lend how much? And that's what we're trying to get at uh, with our review. Uh, and these are not decisions that can be simply made now. So the fact that your shareholders, for example, might be a little bit reluctant to sort of go ahead and, and do something new with callable capital, that makes complete sense. I don't blame them. This is on their budgets. They need to think about this. What we're saying is not just go ahead and do it, but rather sit down together, begin a coordinated process across the MDBs to think about what is this instrument that we have. It amounts to $1.2 trillion across the MDB system. ADB has $134 billion by itself. This is international treaty commitments. This is legal obligations by shareholders. I think that has value. This is basically a guarantee on the MDBs to say, if everything else falls apart, we're there to back you up. And by having that guarantee on top of an already spectacularly performing loan portfolio, we think the MDBs could be taking on more risk. Uh, we understood, and you know, I don't have any details and I'm sure they're not available yet, but discussions are still underway that ADB is indeed, as part of this process that you mentioned, thinking about changes that they might be able to consider in the capital adequacy framework that would release more lending every year. We think that's great that they're talking about that and we would encourage to continue. Uh, it would be great also to consider some of this coordinated work across the MDBs. I know some G7 shareholders, G7 plus shareholders, which I guess about 12 countries, are very interested in moving ahead with this process, and we would hope that ADB uh, would join in on that. Um, also, the IFCAP, of course, that's the, that's a very nice innovation. That's basically taking what ADB originally innovated, which is a portfolio guarantee, and scaling it up uh, to a large facility. So that's that's all very good. Uh, but to us, it's very important to you know this is a great machine. MDBs are very well designed machines and they've worked very well for decades. We think that should be preserved. The AAA should be preserved. There's no reason why the MDBs couldn't be doing more based on their track record. And that's what we're trying uh, to encourage. And, you know, obviously, as we've sort of alluded to, this is just the supply of finance. There's a lot more that needs to be done to the MDBs. You know, where is this money going to go? What kind of projects, what kind of internal processes do the MDBs have? And how do borrowers feel about that? You know, what kind of technical assistance, pipeline um, uh, preparation, and all the rest. Uh, but you know, if you don't have the finance, you don't have any of the rest of it. So we need the finance. Uh, and I think there's also some perception that the you know the capital adequacy reforms are in a way a sort of a distraction from capital increases, which is why some borrower countries have been a little bit reluctant or a little bit suspicious of this agenda. And I can understand that, but that is not, at least that was not the intention of our review. We think both have to happen, uh, but we were unfortunately told in our terms of reference, we can't talk about capital increases. So we weren't allowed to say anything about it, but it seems quite clear considering the needs that are out there that we need to do these reforms as well as a capital increase, as well as these more interesting innovations like IFCAP and the rest. So your support so far has been great. Uh, ADB support generally and engagement, and we hope that that will continue. And because, you know, there is also this idea that, okay, we've done what we could with a calf and now it's done, let's move on to something else. But that's not the case. There's a long process still to go. And so we hope ADB stays in, in, involved in that. Thanks. Can I, well, first, one thing, because you're an expert on calf, uh, I, I need your, uh, I, I'd like to hear your view about the quotable capital. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting idea. I agree with that. Uh, but uh, we found out those, a couple of challenges, including our charter yep. says that uh, we can call on quotable capital only when we have a serious problem in terms of access to capital market. So, uh, in order to, uh, so in the case where you know uh, additional capital is required to prevent default 
of ADB on debt obligations, then capital is, is called, can be called, which means uh, our charter does not prescribe uh, that uh, to, to utilize uh, corporate capital as a risk-bearing capital. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not risk-bearing capital. It's not equity. You can't take part of it, even the AAA part of it, and say that's just as good as equity because it's not. So I completely agree. And that is a bit of a misconception, and that's probably our fault for not articulating it as well as we could have in the report. But the idea is not to try to use it as equity. The idea is to say this is a guarantee that shareholders have given that if the bank is going to fall apart at the end of the day and can't repay its bondholders, you're covered. This guarantee will cover that eventuality at the very end, the most extreme tail risk that a bank could face. And our contention is that by knowing that that risk is covered, you can then shift the way you evaluate risk in your capital adequacy frameworks. Because right now, the MDBs are operating so that their equity capital also covers that same risk. Mm -hmm. So that risk is essentially covered twice. Mm -hmm. And we think that that's not necessary. So we're talking about something that does not involve any changes to the statutes. It doesn't involve any changes to legislation and budgets and all the rest. It's using what's exactly there right now. You know, the only way that that's going to happen is by a process of looking into this across the MDBs and arriving at some consensus about what this callable capital is. And that process still hasn't happened. And we would like that to happen. ODI has a project uh, that, I'm, yeah, <laughs> that I'm involved in. And Bianca here as well is working on it, uh, on looking into exactly that issue supported by the MDB Challenge Fund. We're going to do that. We also think the MDBs themselves and the shareholders should be doing that too at the same time because that will also influence the rating agency methodologies, which is also part of this complex dynamic. Sorry. Just, just one brief, brief thing, you know, I completely agree. It's a guarantee uh, rather than you know, capital, right? Then, then if it's a, it's a guarantee mechanism, I am afraid that some donor countries have a budget, budgetary uh, constraint to provide guarantee. They do, but budgetary constraints normally come by the probability of which the guarantee will be called. And we did this in the CAF review, and we're going to do it again in the current uh, uh, project, more specifically on each MDB. What is the probability that callable capital will ever get called? What would have to happen for that to happen? It's kind of hard to imagine it, what could happen, frankly. But the probability, you know, even if you shock the MDB balance sheets based on a regional crisis where 10% of your portfolio goes on the non-performing every year for five years, you know, you're still not getting to callable capital. This is a long process that would take of an MDB going into you know, bankruptcy, if you can even think about that for an MDB. So the probabilities are far below what any budget would require to provision for. In the European Union, it's about 50% probability. The probability of, of a capital call is far below that. So the idea that any changes that we're proposing would require governments to put this on their balance sheets is simply not the case. Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely agree with Chris. And so what it, this requires is actually in trying to you know, change the risk appetite of some of the senior sort of officials in the MDB. Creating, yeah, oh, true. Yeah. You know, creating the authorizing environment that can reassure them. And the other thing is, you know, I think everyone has alluded to here is actually getting the MDBs to work more together, which is, you know, what um, our project is also focused on. It. And, and Katie also mentioned, you know, the fragmentation of the system, how we can avoid this fragmentation and this coordination. You gave some really interesting example of collaboration of, you know, ADB with other MDBs, uh, which leads me to ask Annalisa, how do you think MDBs can work better as a system? Really good question, but may I just start by asking President Massa, when are you expecting the first visit uh, joint visit to one of the developing member states uh, of the Asian Development Bank together with President Bang uh, and perhaps in other countries with other presidents of MDBs. I mean, I know that MDBs have their own mission statements, their roles, independence and decision making structures that must be respected, uh, but collectively they could coordinate and collaborate better. I mean, so last week when I saw the pictures of the visit of, uh, I mean, Ilan Golfine, the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, together with uh, World Bank President Ajay Banga, first in Peru and then in Jamaica, I thought that kind of those images uh, spoke louder than words. Uh, and it might look normal to many of you here in the room and online uh, to see two presidents in a country on a joint visit, uh, but for me, 
this was a historical moment. <laughs> and I recall a time uh, not long ago when the relationship between the World Bank and the regional development banks uh, was described as the relationship between Snow White uh, and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, and by the way, at that time, uh, the MDB heads uh, was composed of seven regional development banks. <laughs> And I reckon this image is no longer applicable and much progress has been achieved. A couple of years ago, we ran a DUDI, I've always mentioned this, but it's, we, we ask a, a fair good number of government officials in more than 70 countries, I mean, working in finance ministries, online agency with MDBs. Uh, and we ask them in this particular case, in their view, how well MDBs uh, coordinate among themselves on the ground. Uh, and across all regions, uh, only 60% of those government officials told us uh, that they thought uh, MDBs coordinate either well or very well among themselves. So just 60%. Uh, but I have to say that in the case of Asia Pacific, this percentage went up to 81%, and it was far greater than any other region. Mm -hmm. But we need to translate greater cooperation and collaboration across MDBs into action in order that it was a leitmotiv throughout uh, the entire conversation <coughs> that we had today. And we know that countries are trying to find solutions to too many crises at once. I mean, I know it might sound hollow and simplistic, but we need to have the most efficient and effective system to support the developing member countries. So let me reflect on, on three different levels. I mean, already we touched upon in the conversation at the strategic, financial and operational level, where, where I think there should be greater cooperation and coordination among MDBs uh, and also make some suggestions on how we can achieve that. I mean, at the strategy of programmatic level, we know that many countries are trying to integrate climate and development goals in their national planning, but they probably don't really know how to do that. I mean, they don't assess the entire benefits. We know that the costs are falling and they're falling exponentially. And MBBs can really play a strong role here with the technical expertise and knowledge. But they have to come together with really strong ownership of governments. So we shouldn't forget about this. MDB should work as a system to develop country-owned uh, climate and development strategies. Could be the climate, uh, the country climate and development reports. Just one example. It could be country platforms. Uh, but they also need to kind of uh, work together for the implementation. At the financial level, I mean, Chris has already kind of outlined this, but we know that uh, the different. MDBs are working individually towards the implementation of the different recommendations of the CAF review, but they could achieve more if they learn from each other and coordinated their dialogue with credit rating agencies. And again, it's working about on methodologies, on kind of uh, standardizing uh, in innovative kind of instruments. And there are really kind of good space, and Chris already articulated it, it very, very well. I mean, hybrid capital and risk transfer mechanisms. And the final point at the operational level, I mean, in our work, I need to start with a very strong point. I mean, client countries do value what MDBs do, and they found them as very efficient institutions. But in many circumstances, client countries also find uh, the safeguard and procurement policies uh, and processes of MDBs highly complex, cumbersome, and rigid. Uh, and most importantly, that can prevent countries from taking up loans from MDBs. So, and again, a point that, that Kate made, her, made earlier on, that one way to reduce the burden on client countries uh, and ensure that we preserve safeguards and procurement policies, not that we want to ditch them, uh, it's about harmonizing and converging on standards. That's to me, that's a, a big priority. But one, one final point. Uh, for me, is that important? I mean, MDB, MDB management has a very strong role to play on coordination and cooperation. But I also think that the incentives, targets, and monitoring should come from shareholders for MDBs uh, to coordinate and cooperate. And this to, for this cooperation and cooperation to materialize uh, systematically and over time. And I'll stop here. Thanks, Annalisa. Let me open to the audience. We we've got just about 15 minutes because we have to close a little bit earlier. But um, there must be a rolling mic somewhere. Yes, there is. And so um, if you take the floor, say who you are, if you're affiliated to any organization. I'll take two or three from here and then a couple from the online audience and the team can send you online once through. Um, Bianca, please. That was a very subtle hand raise, Sarah. Thanks for catching it. But um, so I'm working uh, at ODI on on different parts of this agenda, and then hearing you all talk about it today was extremely interesting. And and I was hoping that 
maybe a president and Chris, you can put these ideas together in my head of when I look at the IF cap and how it's looking at guarantees and asking donors like the US to go back, question their subsidy rate to understand how much cash they actually have to hold and have conversations simultaneously about the value of callable capital are just our guarantees just having their moment in the sun and we should let them exist as a separate conversation or how can we leverage these discussions happening separately on the supply side to have a coherent message on what donors can think of the money that they're putting into MDBs. Thanks, Bianca. Other questions here? Oh, Peter. Thank you. Uh, Ipek Genj, so I lead the climate team here at ODI. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, really great to hear about the fantastic work that the ADB is doing. Um, and obviously, we know from our research as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, just energy transition partnerships, and in particular about um, the Indonesia and the Vietnam partnership that are kind of currently um, in, in the process. This is an exciting opportunity for MDBs to be working collectively, uh, supporting these countries, and kind of there's a lot of expectation um, on these partnerships to be successful, potentially paving the way for many other countries to be accessing similar support from um, MDBs and multilaterals. So I just wanted to ask you about your um, observations on the process and what you think the prospects are for Indonesia, Vietnam, and others as well. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Liam Thomas, and I work for the National Audit Office, but before I worked for the Asian Development Bank Institute. Um, and my question is, you talked a lot about uh, interesting ideas about unlocking finance that could be used, and just with how challenging it is and uh, with the kind of initiatives that got and how much that sort of reaches like the huge goal of achieving the finance needed, it just on the scale of that and uh, unlocking private capital and things like that. Just, I know there's a lot of ideas floating around, but one idea is looking at like SDR denominated bonds and considering that uh, just in the system right now, like US has about like 70 billion of, S of SDRs like in reserve. And if anyone's kind of given thought to that, uh, all the thought that's kind of about this, about unlocking those and kind of activating those and yeah. Because it hadn't come up in the discussion, strangely, um, any more here. There is uh, one online from Matthew. Does the ADB have any projects to ameliorate the air quality hmm? in the Asian region? The air quality. Um, just very specific, <laughs> but um, someone is interested. Uh, let's start with that. We'll see if we've got time for uh, some more. Uh, there, there are a few um, sort of specific for the ADB, but I don't know if uh, um, you want to address one or two? Okay, so thank you for those questions. Uh, quite, quite briefly about the core capital, once again, uh, we s thought it's a very interesting idea. And uh, but at the same time, we found a couple of challenges, like you know how to deal with our chart and so on. So I need uh, Chris's advice uh, to overcome <laughs> these, these, these difficulties. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but uh, I, I assure you that ADB remains interested in exploring this topic, uh, topic further, and we will uh, reach uh, decisions on the issue in consultation with our shareholders. One problem we are facing is, you know, looks like there is not much enthusiasm among our shareholders about this idea. So how to overcome, Chris, you, you tell me, please. Well, I think one of the most important things, and we've been pushing for this, and we'll be doing it ourselves, is what we're calling a reverse stress test. Reverse yeah, which is, you know, everyone is scared. Our callable capital is going to be called, but I don't think shareholders actually fully really understand how unlikely that is. So to try to put some numbers on that, and that might ease concerns a little bit to then begin to have a more rational conversation about this instrument. But it's all part of this process of, of drilling down and talking specifics rather than speaking in, in, in a bit of generalities, which I think some shareholders have been stuck at the level of, because they don't have the evidence yet. So we need to we need to give them some more evidence before they can make any decisions. I, I, I mean, on Bianca's question, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, your question as well. I think there's another issue, which is a, a strategic and political one, which is, I think, 
we need a clear goal of what we're trying to achieve. And I think there are a number of countries which really aren't there yet. I mean, for those of you that have been involved in Paris, I don't need to tell you, actually trying to get commitments um, from leaders about the level of resource that's going to be required to this point on, not just adequacy, but also increases is really, really important. And as part of that, I mean, you're pointing to, Bianca, an absence of, strategic thought. <laughs> um, there's a million recommendations bubbling up. There's no shortage of brilliant experts providing reasons why this might be feasible. But again and again, we're hearing no from ministries of finance who are incredibly risk averse. And, and sometimes you get the impression that they just can't be bothered to engage. And so I think we need political leadership and I think politicians need to be honest with publics about the level of crisis, the level of jeopardy and what it's going to require to actually solve the situation that we're in, whether it's the climate crisis, you know, the nutrition and food crisis, the debt crisis. I mean, we haven't mentioned uh, the debt crisis so far, but without tackling liquidity issues and the common framework, you know, all of this is somewhat meaningless. So I think there's an absence of political vision. There's an absence of strategic integration. Um, we do need to improve the evidence base. But at this point, I don't see that many technical barriers that can't be overcome through piloting, through engagement. And on the issue of SDRs, for example, there are plenty of proposals about how do you maintain the reserve asset character of SDRs, but still, um, you know, find ways of using those strategically. Um, and I think the, the question is, at Paris, are we going to see the level of leadership that's required and openness and leadership in testing some of these and not just ministries of finance saying, no, 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 too complicated, leave me alone and certainly don't ask for more money, because that is going to kill all of this. And I think we all know that that's, that's not what's needed right now. Very better. Yes, please. Just super briefly, sorry. I mean, this point about political will, and it's not just a technical issue. I completely agree. This is so key. And I mean, this is one, I mean, what, this is why one of our proposals is to get the MDBs themselves and the shareholders themselves to do some of this work, because we can talk as much as we want, but they need to own it. And they, you know, they're sitting back and listening to these ideas and shooting them down most of the time. Uh, so somehow finding a way to get them more engaged and actively looking at the stuff themselves would be would be helpful. Um, and having presided over a number of these conversations now, I can tell you that you know the technical answers, the technical ideas are all there. The evidence is definitely there. So it is the political will that is the one that is missing that leadership. Uh, about should be, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, well, I think uh, this is a very good example of so-called uh, country uh, platform. Uh, which was originally uh, proposed by a G20 eminent persons group uh, chaired by Mr. Tama. And uh, for Indonesia, ADB was designated uh, to support the Secretariat. So we are doing our, our best uh, to make it uh, workable. And in Vietnam, it's a little bit behind in you know, Indonesia, but uh, we are also asked uh, to you know, help uh, to set up the Secretariat and so on. So we are now looking at our uh, internal resources to help Vietnam as well. And uh, ZP is, uh, you know, mainly for uh, transition, just transition, you know, uh, uh, ensure a just transition uh, process. But I think, you know, this kind of uh, country platform idea can be applied for, for other you know, issues uh, like, you know, climate adaptation, resilience and so on. So start with, with, with ZP, I, I think this has a, a potential to be expanded to other, you know, eminent uh, issues as well. Thanks. And if I can jump on the kind of country platforms uh, as well, I mean, uh, it's, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm glad the President Massa kind of recalled uh, there was a recommendation from, from the eminent persons group, but it didn't have that much traction at that time for a number of kind of reasons, I mean, uh, or the leadership, etc. They were all stars aligned, starting with the South African JTP, with the Indonesia, a clear problem, urgent problem to solve uh, with strong ownership by the from the government and also the development partners coming together and that was this is a kind of a key set of ingredients for this type of platforms actually to materialize um, as well and um, I hope many more in Asia Pacific will materialize soon. Thank you very much for raising that it's also a very interesting idea and I really appreciate EBRD and African Bank are taking a leading role 
uh, to realize this you know, idea into reality. Uh, one key issue here is how to preserve uh, the uh, character of the reserve asset of SDR if it's provided to you know, MMDB. But if it's solved, this is, can be another channel uh, to enhance our rendering capacity. So we are very much interested in this idea as well. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this always happens when we need to go. Okay, very quickly, please. Um, Mike to the two, uh, please. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alfie. I'm a student, a public policy student at Oxford. And today I came all the way uh, because I wanted to see uh, Mr. President in person. So I guess um, I'm from Indonesia, by the way. So thank you oh, for... Um, okay. Um, sharing about the GTPs in Indonesia and the G20 experience. Um, I guess I have two sets of questions. Um, first is that what are the available coordinating mechanisms across the MDBs in, um, you know, sort of collectively um, responding to the MDB reforms? Um, and I previously worked at the World Bank in Indonesia. And uh, the MDB reform has always been like a topic that I'm interested about. So I wanted to better understand how do you guys coordinate with each, with each other uh, these days? And second, I guess um, we talked earlier about the COP. Uh, I guess um, it would be great to hear from your perspective, what are your expected outcome in the upcoming COPs? Um, and especially, I guess the biggest milestone from the last COP was the lost and damage fund. So how would you expect the loss and damage fund to be operationalized at the next um, COP? Thank you. Thank you. You can just take one, one last one. I need to close that and she was before you, Sam. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, I'm at ODI and I spend my life looking at the mobilization of private finance. Um, and I just wanted to get your kind of perspectives on this agenda from the Asian Development Bank's perspective. If the MDBs have just published the mobilization reports, numbers are fairly stagnant. The whole system's mobilizing about 60 billion. So we need fundamental changes to business models and approaches if we are going to shift the needle in terms of mobilization of private capital. A lot of the discussion has been on, on the public side of things. So what's the kind of conversation that ASDB and the thinking about this in terms of, do you see any uh, direction from your shareholders with regard to this, any key kind of changes you may see to how you go about mobilizing capital? Some examples. So most MDBs invest at a transactional kind of approach to mobilize finance. But really, if we're going to shift the needle, we need a lot more kind of portfolio um, approaches. Um, incentives, you're incentivized to get money out of the door, not necessarily mobilize private capital. I could go on and on, but I won't. But I'm just wondering at a very high level, what's, the thing, what's your thinking on this, on this agenda, especially in your region where I think there's huge potential to mobilize private capital into kind of upper middle income countries who are heavily dependent on fossil fuels. So very quickly, so we can close uh, the rounds. So uh, you, you have uh, a colleague who's come all the way to, <laughs> to be able to speak to you in person. Yeah, okay. Starting with the uh, last Stop. question, uh, private uh, capital mobilization. Uh, we very much would like to mobilize private capital, recognizing that, you know, our financing alone will be uh, far for short of you know the demand in infrastructure financing in climate financing and so on so we have a clear you know numerical target uh, that you know uh, if we uh, provide one dollar private financing uh, 2.5 additional you know, private financing will be in our company so the leverage ratio is one should be one to 2.5 by 2030 uh, right now we are around one point unless I'm wrong two one, one to 2.1 or something like that, but it's improving. Uh, so we'd like to really, you know, uh, make our best effort uh, to uh, you know, uh, improve this ratio as much as possible, as, as quickly as possible. And also, in order to attract private, private capital, the project must be bankable. And, uh, you know, and some incentive need to be provided. So, there, there must be some, you know, a couple of uh, financial financial uh, instrument 
uh, to make it uh, bankable by, for example, by just you know, transferring the risk and so on. Uh, so we, we'd like to work on uh, those mechanisms to, to make uh, our project more bankable to attract more and more private capital. Um, about uh, our COP, yeah, you know, I think the key key issue here is, you know, environment, climate, climate issue, uh, environment issue is for everybody. And it's a uh, so-called public, global public goods. So the most important thing we have bear in mind is that, you know, climate change issue should not be politicized. If it's going to be politicized, we, we are going nowhere. Any wise words. Any final comments, Chris, Kate, um, on the visa? No. The has to go. Uh, no, absolutely. And I think you, you know, you are you you close really well. I mean, the, there is no discussion. And, and and I think you know this conversation has been fantastic to to have yet tangible um, example of how climate commitments and commitments to you know sort of better financing for development can come together and the MDBs can really sort of show, you know, innovative ways of combining the, the two priorities. Thank you very much, you, you know, President Massa, Annalisa, thank you. Kate, thank you. Uh, Chris. This was a really a great, uh, insightful conversation. Um, thank you to the online audience. Uh, for those who want to listen again, the recording will be online immediately after um, the end of, uh, of the event. Uh, for those of you who are here, we can carry on the conversation over some drinks and nibbles next door. But before that, please join me in thanking very much our speakers. Too.